Mr. Vikram Singh Mehta will now deliver the 28th Lalit Toshi Memorial Lecture on Energy Atmanirbharta, Meeting Emergent Challenges. Please give him a very warm welcome. Thank you, Bharat, for your very generous introduction. You uh, flatter me, although I have to say that I was hoping that Tasneem had more substantive reasons for, for her interest in me, but that apart. <laughs> um, Mrs. Pratima Doshi, members of the Doshi family, Ambassador Vijay Nambia, other trustees of the Lalit Doshi Memorial Foundation, Shri Vipin Sharma, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> it is a great privilege for me to be here today to deliver the 26, 28th Lalit, Mor Lalit Doshi Memorial Lecture. Many have preceded me onto this stage and all with a very distinguished record of public service. And when I look back at the names, I'm not just humbled, but also struck by the testimony that this list confers on Lalit Doshi's contribution to public policy and national development. Edmund Burke, the British philosopher and parliamentarian, once said, no man made a greater mistake than he who did nothing because he felt that he could do so little. To read about what Lalit Doshi achieved in his 20s, seven years of public service makes clear that he made no such mistake. Whatever the challenge and however steep the odds, Sri Lalit Doshi made an effort to shift the needle and he made a difference. I met Sri Lalit Doshi a couple of times when he was a joint secretary in the Ministry of Petrochemicals and I was an advisor to the public sector oil company Oil India. I had just returned from a four-year stint with an American multinational, and aside from the 18 months that I spent as an IAS prob probationer before resigning from the service, I was relatively inexperienced with the workings of government. My responsibility was to develop the strategic plan for Oil India, and by extension, to offer thoughts on how India might approach the development of its indigenous hydrocarbon resources. I sought the advice of many senior officials. The memory of my meeting with Sri Doshi is etched in my memory. He was generous with his time and with his views. And I remember thinking that it was because of officers like him that the Indian civil service had deserved or deserved the accolade of being the steel frame of good governance. Ladies and gentlemen, my subject today, as you all know, is Energy Atma Nirbharta Meeting Emergent Challenges. My focus will be on providing a roadmap by which India can meet the overarching objectives of providing access to all its citizens to affordable, reliable, secure, and clean energy. But let me start by clarifying the interpretation of the word Atmanirbharta. I want to make sure that you understand I'm using it in the literal sense of self-reliance and not as some, as some com commentators on energy have stretched it to mean self-sufficiency. I'm not suggesting that self-sufficiency is not a worthwhile objective. It is, of course. But given the nature of the energy market, there is an economic threshold beyond which the opportunity cost of finding and developing our indigenous resources could run counter to national interest. In, circum in certain circumstances, it matters less as to who owns the energy asset and or where it is located, and more whether one has rights of access and the strategic autonomy to safeguard against unexpected disruptions. I provide this definitional clarity because I will later, in the concluding half of my talk, outline a TED 
a 10-point roadmap for meeting emergent challenges. This plan, this 10-point roadmap, flows from this interpretation. The world energy market has been radically transformed over the past few years. This is, a, this is the result of a complex of cross-cutting global challenges. The pandemic, climate change, the Ukraine conflict, and the possibility that President Putin might cross the nuclear Rubicon, economic recession. These are just some of the shocks that have hit the global system. These are disparate shocks, but they have interacted with each other to create what a Financial Times correspondent, Adam Tooze, defines as a polycrisis. He attributes his word polycrisis to the French philosopher Edgar Morin, who defines it as a situation where the impact of the whole overwhelms the impact of the sum of the parts. And as a result, it is not possible to find a single cause for the crisis and therefore prescribe a single remedy. Now, were my talk on the altered contours of the international order, I would have provided details of this transformation. But it is not. It is on India. And so what I will do in the first 10 minutes or so of my talk, limit myself to outlining five consequential issues that emerge from this international order. I will define five issues that emerge because of this transformation that has taken place in the international energy market. And I believe that our decision makers must factor these five issues when contemplating how to meet the challenges that, that lie ahead. The first is, of course, the inescapable reality that the world is moving towards an ecological abyss. Fortunately, the debate on this subject is now over. The most hardened critic of scientific prognostications have accepted the reality of global warming. Even the former US President Trump, who pronounced that climate change was the greatest scientific hoax ever perpetrated on mankind, has altered his tune. All segments of society, government, business, and civic are now publicly committed to the pathway of decarbonization. Unfortunately, such public statements of intent are still not matched by action and implementation. The recently concluded COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh that was supposed to detail the action plans on the decisions taken the year before in Paris, did little more than agree to set up a compensatory fund to support the poor countries most affected by global warming. And even on that, they could not agree on the quantum of the fund, the contributors, and the governance structure. A recent cover story of The Economist magazine was captioned, goodbye to 1.5 degrees. This is an alarming trend for India. We all know India is not responsible for the increase in global temperatures, but that does not dilute the fact that we Indians will be the most affected. 250 million people live along our coastline and rising sea levels will threaten their livelihoods. Million, millions more in UP, Bihar, and, the, and northern India will face the traumas of drought and flooding triggered by the melting of the Himalayan glaciers. Scientists estimate that the lifespan of, dwellers in, of city dwellers in India will reduce by 7.6 years because of, air because of air pollution. The hard truth is we, India, cannot afford the incrementalism of multilateral symmetry. We cannot develop now and clean up later. The second consequence of the international transformation of the international order 
is deglobalization. Maybe that is not the right word for describing the consequence of the Ukraine conflict. The technology and Cold War, the technology and trade Cold War between USA and China, the militarization of the South China Seas over Taiwan, and the drawing down of a second Iron Curtain. Maybe globalization is not dead or indeed dying. But what is without doubt is that these geopolitical and geoeconomic events have killed off the notion that the world is flat or a global village. Let me here, as an aside, highlight three, three ways by which this particular geopolitical uh, event or this particular geopolitical trend has significance for India. One, we are seeing a tightening energy embrace between Russia and China. The two countries signed a no limits friendship agreement a week before Russian tanks trundled into Ukraine. Later, Russia committed to building a second gas pipeline to China. And now, over the past few months, China has become the largest buyer of Russian crude crude oil. I should add that one of the Chinese companies, China, Chinese Energy Company Limited, has a near 15% shareholding in the Russian national oil company Rosneft. And Rosneft is the largest shareholder of the former SR refinery, now called Nayara, in Jamnagar. This energy embrace raises several questions for us in India. Can we rely on a post-Ukraine weakened Russia that is in hock to our adversary China for supplies of Russian crude oil, gas, and military spares? What will be Russia's response if we get into another geopolitical imbroglio with China? Might the fact that Rosneft is subject to Western sanctions exposed Naira, our refinery, to trading constraints? These are questions that will have to be addressed by our policymakers. The second issue of con concern to us or of importance to us is the shift in Saudi Arabia's foreign policy. According to Karen Young, a senior research scholar at the Center for Global Energy at Columbia University, Saudi Arabia has decided to regard its relationships with the West as transactional, not strategic. In her view, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's goal is to achieve a Saudi first leadership position in, and I quote, a revived, non-aligned world and in the international energy market. This foreign policy shift has implications for India because Saudi is and will remain a critical supplier of crude oil and gas and a strategically important business partner. Now, the, the third issue that I want to, uh, that, that, has, that emerges from the changes that have taken place in the global environment is, and this is a personal observation, is the fact that I have been struck by the extraordinary impact that individual leaders have had on the international oil market. Let me, let me illustrate with two examples. President Putin marched into Ukraine in February 24 this year. That was his singular call. He made that decision on his own. I have no doubt about that. But the impact of that decision on the market energy market has been totally unprecedented. The price of gas in Europe peaked in June at the extraordinary level of $500 of oil price equivalent. Today, the price of oil is $85. Europe is currently facing a very cold winter, not just because the temperatures are low, but because of energy rationing. A second example, 
A year before, in March 2020, or two years ago, in an act that had just the opposite impact, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman took the unilateral decision to flood the market at a time the world was shutting down on account of the COVID pandemic. It was an ego-driven move to hold on to market share. The price of oil crashed to the point that at one, on one day in April, it fell into negative territory. That is, the traders, the oil traders who had crude oil contracts had to actually pay to offload their obligation. There are several other leaders in the world today with plenty of potentially authority over their petroleum and energy policy. President Maduro of Venezuela, Ayatollah Khomeini of Iran, the monarchs of Kuwait and the United Arab Emirates, and several others. So the point that I want to make is that it's never been easy to call the international oil market because the market has been influenced by not just the fundamentals of demand and supply, but also by the non-fundamentals of geopolitics, exchange rate movements, and Wall Street speculators. But now, I would say that we need to add one more variable to the equation, the personal predilections of individual leaders. Our, our Ministry of Petroleum might be well advised to bring a psychologist into the office to help them determine the direction of the international oil market. Now, one more very important development that needs to be emphasized is the recognition that the clean energy supply chain, like the oil market, is very concentrated. Look at, for instance, the value chain for electric vehicles. Lithium, nickel, cobalt, and copper, these are the critical minerals for the manufacture of electrical vehicles, electric vehicles. 50% of lithium is mined in Australia, 35% of nickel in Indonesia, 50% of cobalt in the Democratic Republic of, of Congo, and 30 per, 38%, 40% actually, of copper in Peru and Chile. But that's not all. When it comes to the second stage of the value chain, the processing, 60% of lithium is processed in China. 70% of copper is processed and refined in China. In China. 40% of nickel is processed in China. And, excuse me, 70% of the cobalt is refined and processed in China, and 47% of copper is refined in China. The point I'm making is that the value chain of, the, of clean energy is concentrated, and China dominates that value chain. You could also actually look at another commodity, the semiconductor value chain. Semiconductors are also crucial for the clean energy transition. Here, the Korean companies Samsung and Hynix together produce 44% of the world's memory chips, and Taiwan's company TM TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, fabricates 92% of the world's most advanced chips. The point I want to make is that the clean energy transition is creating new centers of energy power. China will dominate, and frankly, were TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Conduct, uh, Company, fabrication facilities, were those fabrication facilities to fall into an earthquake fault or destroyed by military action, one third of the world's computing power would be would come to a grinding halt. India will have to take this supply chain vulnerability into its plan for energy security. Another very important development is the cost competitiveness of renewables. Many, many studies have been done to show how the cost gap between renewables and coal has narrowed. 
Let me just cite one to give you a sense of the pace at which this gap has been narrowed. This is a study done by Bloomberg's. In 2010, the average cost of solar electricity was $360 a meg megawatt hour. Today, it is down to 60. The cost of offshore wind electricity in 2010 was 190. Today, it's down to 75. The cost of manufacturing a lithium iron battery was $1,000 a kilowatt. Today, it is less than 150. One can, these numbers may not be totally accurate. They may, be, they may not be up to date, but you can see how rapidly the gap has narrowed. So I could, tell, I could say a lot more about the international context, but I wanted to highlight these five because a lot of what we now have to think about flows from some of these international developments. But now let me just turn to the Indian market and then come to my prescription for how we can meet the challenges. So a sketch. Here's just a very, very broad sketch of the Indian energy landscape. And I can do no more than sketch because clearly I don't have the time. We are the world's third largest consumer of energy in the world. But on a per capita basis, our energy consumption is one third of the global average and almost one tenth of the US, of USA. The pace of growth of energy consumption in India has been amongst the fastest in the world because, our la because of our large population, because of rapid economic growth, and because of the policy of subsidizing consumption of LPG, diesel, and kerosene. Poor demand management and inefficiency of usage have also contributed to this space. 80% of our energy basket comprises of coal, oil, and biomass. We have the fifth largest deposits of coal in the world, and next to China, we are the second largest producer. Coal provides 55% of our commercial energy requirements. We do have oil and gas in 26 sedimentary basins, but these are located in complex geology and harsh topography. And even when located, it is therefore difficult that it is difficult to locate, and even when located, it is therefore difficult to produce them on a commercial basis. As a result, the gap between domestic consumption and domestic supplies has consequently widened. Today, we import around 4.2 million barrels a day of oil, and that is around 85% of our total consumption. Non-fossil electricity generation is around 150 gigawatts out of a total electricity installed capacity of 388 gigawatts. Of that, solar is 60 gigawatts, large hydro 45, wind 40, and nuclear just under seven. And then a final hard truth. Energy transitions unfold over decades. Edison illuminated the lower half of Manhattan in 1885. It took American factories another 50 years to convert from steam power to electric power. This is because those factories were not designed to take this revolutionary new technology. They had to be rebuilt or they had to be redesigned or rebuilt. The fact is that fossil fuels are embedded in our economy, and we will need massive investments to transition from a fossil fuel economy to a clean energy economy. So irrespective of the pace of change or the pace at which we increase the share of renewables in our energy basket, we must accept that coal, oil, and gas will remain a dominant part of our energy basket for decades to come. Now with that international backdrop and a sketch of the domestic um, energy landscape in India, let me list out what I would do to meet emergent challenges. I have a 10 point roadmap and I will sketch it again because each of those recommendations could be the subject of 
a 45-minute speech. The first is that we must overhaul the current siloed structures of energy decision making. There are today six ministries directly engaged with aspects of energy. The ministries of petroleum and natural gas, coal, power, renewables, atomic, and the government think tank Niti Aayog. In addition, there are separate ministries that have responsibility for domains that are impacted by energy, water, food, environment, to just to mention just a few, to mention just three, I guess. Each of these ministries are headed by a minister and have a phalanx of bureaucrats supporting the minister. Each knows what needs to be done for their particular domain. And by, and by and large, each do their job well and on its own merit. No one, however, has oversight over the totality of the energy system. And there is no one other than the prime minister, perhaps, who is accountability for the whole picture. And the fact that the collective impact of separate decisions taken by these different ministries could have a systemic impact. The first step towards meeting the challenge of, Atma, of energy Atma Nirbhartha must therefore be to perforate these ministerial silos and create an institutional structure that enables the formulation of energy policy within a holistic and integrated framework. Ideally, the government should create an omnibus Ministry of Energy with departments of petroleum, coal, renewables, and power. But this would require a major administrative overhaul, and it would most, and it would most certainly invoke the resistance of vested interests. So rather than let the perfect be the enemy of the good, my suggestion is the Prime Minister should create a Department of Energy Resources and Security in his office. This department should have inter alia responsibility for formulating an integrated energy strategy. It should develop clear, transparent monitoring and evaluation systems to ensure that resources are optimally allocated and utilized. It should incubate new areas of research and it should create an integrated energy database. My second recommendation flows from the first. The goal of energy Atman Nirbharta must receive legislative sanction. Parliament should pass an act. Call it Energy Responsibility and, and Security Act, or simply the Energy Atman Nirbharta Act. But the fact is, that energy is in the interstices of every aspect of our economy. It is critical to our future and therefore should be elevated to a national priority. Its implementation through the, re through the redefined, restructured, integrated administrative system that I have just talked about should be backed by legislative sanction. My third recommendation relates to oil and gas. As I said, we will remain dependent on oil and, oil and gas for decades to come. The oil and gas, we are importing over 80% of our requirements. And we have to do something to alleviate the consequential supply side vulnerability. I have six suggestions specifically focused on the oil and gas sector. First, it's a bit technical. But the revenue, the revenue sharing model for fresh exploration should, re, should be replaced with a profit sharing model. Investors in oil and gas exploration are currently required to share a percentage of their revenues even before they've recovered their costs. This is a deterrent as oil and gas exploration is a highly risky capital intensive activity and the revenue and and potential, and potential investors want assurance that if they, take the, if they take the risk of exploration, the first call on revenues that they generate, that the first call on the revenues that they generate from a commercial discovery can be allocated towards the recovery of this risk capital. There's no guarantee that this change will trigger a flow of private capital, but I can be, I'm sure that there's a high probability that without a change, without such a change, there will be no substantive incremental interest in oil and gas exploration. 
Several of our producing fields are aging with declining rates of recovery of oil and gas. Mumbai High Offshore Field is a notable example. Its average rate of recovery is around 28, or maybe now even less. This means that for every 100 molecules in the reservoir, we are able to produce only around 28. I'm told the average global recovery rate for fields of comparable geology is around 40. Enhanced oil recovery techno technologies exist. Some can be bought off the shelf, others only through strategic partnerships. But the government should find the appropriate technology and partners to increase the recovery rate to at least the global average. We currently hold 10 days of strategic petroleum reserves. In addition, our oil marketing companies have storage capacity equivalent to another 65 days of consumption. But given the inherent volatility of the oil market, my recommendation is that we should expand our strategic reserves to at least 30 days so that at any one time, we have around three months of supplies in storage somewhere in the country. Gas is a relatively clean fuel. It is a versatile product, and there are a diversity of supply sources outside the Middle East. USA, Russia, and Australia are, for instance, important exporters. It is currently very expensive, but this is an aberration. We should, prefer, we should prepare for a different price scenario. We should be prepared for a different lower price scenario and accelerate the creation of the requisite gas import facilities and pipeline grid to enable an increase in the market share of gas. As I've already indicated, Saudi, Arabia, it will, Saudi Arabia's influence over the direction of the petroleum market will increase over time. It is the only country with significant surplus producible reserves of low-cost oil. We must therefore assiduously nurture our relations with these countries with this country and the other Gulf countries. Our diplomats must add the arrow of oil diplomacy to their quiver. And finally, there will be attractive merger and acquisition opportunities that will arise as international oil companies reorient their asset portfolio towards renewables and away from, Ch and away from petroleum. China will be our main competitor for these opportunities. To beat them, we must place the weight of India Inc. behind our offer. The office of the Prime Minister should be the architect of such a bidding strategy. The next larger point is, has to do with coal. Coal presents us with a conundrum. It is the cheapest of fuels. 52% of our electricity is generated from coal. Millions owe their livelihood to the coal economy, and powerful political and business interests have a vested, in, have a vested interest in the, in, 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 the, in the sector. But it is the dirtiest of fuels. It has to be phased out if we are to meet our net zero carbon commitments. So what can be done to crack this conundrum? I do not frankly have an answer, but I can make some suggestions for small steps that may eventually and in time lead to a major transformation. We should intensify research and development in green technologies like coal gasification and carbon sequestration and capture. We must, or we should contemplate, I should say, the upgradation of old thermal plants, or maybe even the closure of old thermal plants and that are running on subcritical and inefficient turbines. We should not approve new thermal power plants. We should contemplate the introduction of carbon taxes to, to reflect the externalities of coal emissions. And we should establish very sophisticated systems for, me for measuring and monitoring coal emissions by our industry. All of this are marginal steps towards an eventual phase out, phase down leading to phase out of the coal economy 
in decades to come. As far as renewables is concerned, as I said, the progress has been ambitious, has been very impressive, and our targets are ambitious. But in order for renewables to really scale up, India will need to direct massive investments towards the upgradation of the grid and towards battery storage capacity. Furthermore, the government will need to integrate renewables into the mainstream of, of power system planning and procurement. And it will have to sort out somehow the balance sheets of the state distribution companies. Demand management and conservation, this is my sixth recommendation, has been a very neglected part of the energy equation. It is, however, in my view, the most effective and inexpensive means of reducing dependence. In Europe today, the very simple act of turning down the thermostat had a, has had a huge impact, and a huge positive impact in managing the current crisis. Now, a lot can be said on demand management, and I, again, don't have time to go into it, but just to give you a flavor of the scale and the potential, here are some thoughts. Reduce the consumption of diesel in agriculture. Redesign existing buildings and factories. Standardize building regulations and, in, and emission norms. Expand public transport systems. And ensure that all new construction meets green norms. I have already indicated that the supply chain for minerals, metals, and chips are concentrated. And we will have to do something to reduce our vulnerability to this particular fact. It's going to take a long time. But what people don't seem to appreciate, and we have done some study in our think tank, the Center for Social and Economic Progress, that India actually contains substantive reserves of cobalt, nickel, copper, and heavy rare earth materials. The fact is that we have simply not done enough to expedite the mining and processing of these of these metals. So a very simple first step must be to remove the obstacles that have impeded the mining of these crucial minerals and metals, crucial for effectu effectuating the clean energy transition. Of course, in the interim, because it's going to take a long time before we can bring any new facilities on stream, it takes an average of 15 years to, from start to the actual commissioning of a, of a new mining plant. In the interim, we will have to seek supplies from all over for these crucial metals. We will have to reduce our dependency on China. And so this is another arrow. Metal diplomacy, minerals diplomacy is another arrow that our diplomats will have to place in their quiver. A very, something that very few people talk about, but I just want to emphasize, and I hope someone will note it, that in the coming years, our energy sector will require a very different human resource skill set. We will not need as many workers for oil rigs, but we will definitely need a lot more technicians to manage solar farms. We don't have, there's a gap right now, a skill gap, and we need to bridge that skill gap. And so I would recommend that the government collaborate with, our, with the private sector to set up training and skilling facilities to bridge this gap. Technology is, of course, critical. There's no question about it that our clean energy transition will depend hugely on technological innovation and progress. Green hydrogen, modular nuclear reactors, third generation bio, battery storage, these are all technologies that will that are disruptive and frontier, and we will have to make sure that we have access to them. But it is not enough to just have access to new technology. It is also important that we know how to utilize this technology. And that is where, again, we need to focus. Access to technology is one thing, but the utilization of technology efficiently is something we tend to ignore. And in that regard, there is one very simple next step that we should take 
There is a clean energy fund that the government has set up in order to provide R&D facilities and resources for technology. That fund must be governed and administered by people who have domain knowledge. That is not the case right now. And finally, my tenth suggestion, and that is a suggestion, frankly, that does not have the kind of specificity that I have laid out for the first nine. And that has to do with political statesmanship. It is a suggestion that actually is necessary if we want to implement the first nine. We need a leadership that makes decisions today that a decade or so later, they can look back on and say, that was the right thing to do. So ladies and gentlemen, let me be clear. There is no simple straight path from where we are today to the goal of energy Atmanirbhata. The path will twist and turn. It will be like a labyrinth. There will be obstacles. Some will be familiar, others will be unexpected but none will be insuperable. They can all be overcome. All obstacles can be overcome. But only if we hold fast to our objectives, only if we are determined and persistent, and only if our leadership stays the course in the face of inevitable short-term exigencies. Thank you very much. Thank you again for honoring me with this.